Hi everyone, I'm Hugh Martin, professor in the Department of English and Fine Arts. Welcome to the 16th annual David L. Janetta Distinguished Lecture in War, Literature, and the Arts. I want to begin this evening by thanking our sponsor, Mr. David Janetta, a 1975 graduate of the Academy and the USAFA Endowment for making this endowed lecture possible. Please, please welcome our distinguished guest this evening, the Vice Superintendent, Colonel Matt Huseman, the Vice Dean for Academics, Colonel Brian Neff, the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Dean of the Faculty, Chief Michael Diedrich and his spouse, Jenny, and Department Head of English and Fine Arts, Colonel Dave Buchanan. We also welcome all permanent professors and department heads and other special guests in attendance. And it's now my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage our benefactor, a tremendous supporter of the humanities, Mr. Janetta, who will introduce our speaker. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, Anyone from the class of uh, 2024 here? Ooh, how about 25? 26? <laughs> 27? Oh, man. Wow. Now, that's impressive. I, I, I hope but uh, you had that same energy level on Saturday as you guys beat the Utah, what are they? The Aggies, something like that? Okay. Well, anyway, good evening. It's my pleasure to be back again to um, welcome our guest lecturer, Arthur, our author Luke Mogelson. Uh, we had a chance to spend a lot of time with Luke over the last couple of days here in, in various classrooms, and Luke told me the story about the time he was presenting a sort of an all services brief at an undisclosed location. Uh, I think it was in Af Afghanistan. And he decided during a break that he was going to ask the five or four, I guess, four, service, four, four services that were represented a question. And he turned to the sailor that was there and said, what would you do if you woke up and found a, uh, a scorpion in your tent? And the sailor said, well, I'd step on it. And that's the logical answer. So Luke turned to the soldier and said, um, what would you do if you found a large scorpion in, the, in your tent? And the West Pointer said, I'd squish it with my boot. And that, again, was a decent answer. He turned to the Marine and said, what would you do? And the Marine said, well, I'd pick it up and tear off the stinger and I would eat it. And he thought, well, that's definitely a, a, a Marine there. So then he turned to the Air Force lieutenant and said, well, what would you do? And the Air Force lieutenant said, well, I'd call room service and try to find out why there's a tent in my room. <laughs> and uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, hey, that, that's a true story now, come on. Um, as a matter of perspective, uh, is the scorpion an enemy, or is the scorpion a meal, or simply a distraction in our lives? Who, I, th I think we, I want to talk just briefly about perspective. And I thought back and realized that I'm coming up on my 50th anniversary or, of graduation here from the zoo. And I tried to look back at a 50-year perspective, and, and it, it was really stunning and striking to me some of the things that I realized. The first was not in this very room, but in this building collectively in this room academically. We were in a constitutional law class in 1973, and I vividly remember the Supreme Court issuing its decree in Roe versus Wade, which said women have the right to uh, their own, making their own health care decisions, right to privacy. And it was, it was pretty amazing because it was a very controversial issue, and we were happy that once and for all, this was settled law, and we would never, as a nation, have to engage in any sort of discourse around this area. Oops, you know, 50 years later, 
um, almost to the day uh, the Dobbs decision is announced and it overturns Roe versus Wade. And once again, we're in a national turmoil about this issue that it's going to become very contentious over the next couple of years for sure. Fifty years ago, I think actually may, may have been in this very room, we learned about this thing that they called the Watergate break-in. And I assumed everybody knows what that is, but I'm quickly realizing very few people probably know because it's been 50 years. But the Watergate break-in led to uh, the Congressional Watergate hearings, which led to the House Judiciary Committee issuing uh, impeachment uh, proceedings against then-President Nixon. And before the uh, Congress was able to vote on impeachment, uh, Nixon resigned office in, I think it was October 8th, or August 8th of, uh, of 1974. And once again, we were thrown into a national, or we were in the middle of a national crisis, <clears throat> which we just couldn't imagine ever happening again. And of course, 50 years later, what's happening? Um, the, uh, we have a former president who was twice impeached, potentially running against an incumbent president, facing an impeachment inquiry, and once again, national chaos and turmoil abound. In 1975, the year I graduated, again in this building, we learned that the Vietnam War ended, the first time the United States was defeated in war. The Viet Cong uh, took control of the Saigon Airport. All the roads around the city were closed. And there was this very famous, iconic photo. And if you haven't seen it, you really should try to find it. There's a, a helicopter landing on, on top of a hotel building uh, on a tower. And then there was a ladder that went down to the roof. And there's a CIA operative standing there. And he's um, helping the evacuees one at a time come up from the ground across the roof, up the step ladder, and into the uh, into the helicopter, and that's how they evacuated the city. It was the largest evacuation by helicopter, uh, I think, probably ever in, in our history. But but again, the war was over, and we hoped to never see such chaos as that again. And um, like I said, oops, here we go. The Taliban uh, in 2021 declared victory and took control of Kabul on August 15th of that year, and the NATO-backed Islamic Republic collapsed, and we all watched in horror as the, uh, all of the efforts at the Hamid Karzai International Airport over the ensuing days trying to evacuate uh, those that wanted to leave. And once again, another fiasco that we had hoped to never see again prevailed. So that's you know, I think sometimes it feels like we're stuck in a time warp where things just keep happening again and again and we can't figure out how to get out of them. And I certainly don't have any answers, but our hope is that by inviting speakers like Luke to come speak who have been in all of these war zones and um, has talked to all sorts of people can shed a little light and perhaps connect some dots to help us better, better understand how we might, 50 years from now, when you're standing here, look back and say, well, finally, we, we ended that cycle uh, somehow. So Luke Mogelson is a contributor to The New Yorker and The New York Times Magazine, covering the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and Iraq, as well as the riots in Minneapolis after the murder of George Floyd and the January 6th attack on the Capitol. His debut book, which I think most of you have read, These Heroic Happy Dead, received critical acclaim, as did his recent work, The Storm Is Here, America on the Brink, which really is a must read to better understand what's happening in America today. So please uh, join me in giving a very warm Air Force Academy welcome to Luke Mogelson. Luke. Thanks, David. Thank you. How's it going? Um, 
I met some of you all today and had some really interesting conversations um, that I appreciated and I'm grateful for, and I'll try not to repeat myself here. Uh, the main thing I wanted to talk to you about is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which I've been covering for The New Yorker for the past year and a half. <clears throat> but I'd like to start with some of my experiences in what we used to call the global war. Because I think that era of conflict kind of set the stage both for how this one would be fought militarily and covered journalistically. So this is the street uh, that I lived on in Kabul between 2011 and 2014. And uh, just by the way, these, all the photos I'm going to show here, I took myself usually with an iPhone, um, as well as the videos, unless I say otherwise. Some of them were uh, professional photographers. You'll probably notice the difference. Same street in, in winter. Uh, I moved to Kabul when I was 28, after completing a three-year contract with the New York Army National Guard. I'd been a medic in the 69th Infantry Division, but I never deployed and I was eager to get overseas and, and see Afghanistan. Uh, September 11th happened when I was 19, and the ensuing invasion of Afghanistan had been the defining historical event for my generation and people my age. And just by the way, I'm curious, uh, by a show of hands, how many people here were born after September 11th, 2001? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's almost impossible for guys my age um, and Professor Martin's age uh, who deployed to Iraq um, uh, after, after 2001 as well um, to explain how much the world changed that day um, and how much our lives changed that day. But I'm going to try here a little bit to to allude to that trajectory. Um, early on, when I arrived in Kabul, I uh, met some other expats at, a, at the bar of the hotel where I was staying, and they uh, offered to rent me a room in this house uh, where seven other freelancers, researchers, and aid workers lived, all of them pretty unexpectedly European and female. Uh, before not really relevant, but it was, it was weird. <laughs> uh, before arriving in Afghanistan, I'd, uh, I'd conceived of it, I think, from a rather colonialist perspective, mainly as a theater of conflict or uh, an arena for an American foreign war more than as a nation in its own right. That changed quickly after I arrived, and like many foreigners, um, I quickly became enamored of its extraordinarily rich and complex culture and history. And instead of three months, which I was planning uh, to stay for, I stayed for three years in this house, which was cold in the winter. Uh, in those days, despite periodic kidnappings and suicide bombings, you could live in Kabul pretty normally. Uh, I got around either by foot or on a bicycle, shopped at the local markets, went to parties and on long hikes in the surrounding hills. And the longer I stayed, the more apparent the disconnect became between the country that I was learning about and experiencing and the country uh, as it was perceived by my compatriots, fellow Americans, uh, who lived behind the Hesco bastions and T-wall of the fobs. Do, does everybody here know what those words mean? Hesco and T-wall, fobs? Forward operating beast, yeah. Uh, one day I was pushing my bike home from the market and I had two bags of groceries hanging on the handlebars and I turned into an alley and there was a group of U.S. soldiers in full battle rattle pulling security outside of a private compound. Uh, and I approached them and said hello and told them I was an American, and they were shocked, stunned. Um, 
and so was I because as I got closer, I saw on the on their uniforms the patches for the 69th Infantry Division, which was my uh, my former unit um, in in the guard. And uh, they asked me, "What are you doing here?" And I told them, "I live here." Uh, and they said, what do you mean you live here? And I said, I mean, I live here. It, it was a disorienting encounter, I think, for all of us. We were standing in the same spot at the same moment in time. We came from the same place and spoke the same language, but we inhabited totally different worlds. I think this anecdote, uh, just as an aside, kind of illustrates a bit of one of the fundamental contradictions of what was the prevailing military doctrine of the day, counterinsurgency, or COIN, as it was known. Have, have you all heard of that, COIN? Um, theoretically, the soldiers in that alley, according to COIN, uh, like all U.S. service members in Afghanistan, were supposed to be winning hearts and minds and protecting the population, as we used to say but they'd been trained and conditioned to perceive that population as uh, alien and hostile. So it was essentially an, an impossible mission for the uh, enlisted soldiers charged with uh, executing it. Of course, the rhetoric of COIN often belied its reality, which was not so different from that of every other war in every other country throughout history. Groups of people, usually men, trying to kill each other with whatever means they have at their disposal. Combat, in other words. This has always been the immutable essence of war, and it was a phenomenon that, as a writer, I wanted to see for myself. Then, as now, the only way to do so was via what we call embedded journalism. When a reporter lives for a period of time, uh, with the combatants in one or another party to a conflict. For the first decade of so, or so of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the US military had an official embed system that facilitated this process and made it relatively easy. So I was able to spend two months with US Marines in Helmand province for this story. And these photographs I did not take, you can probably tell. This was the Dutch photographer Joël von Hoot who I worked with a lot in Afghanistan. He also took this one when we embedded uh, with the Afghan National Army in Wardak province. And this one, uh, after a three week, or during a three week embed with the 82nd Airborne Division in Ghazni province. <clears throat> uh, when I first started embedding with combat units, I was pretty nervous about how I'd be received as a journalist, as a civilian, but I found that uh, frontline soldiers almost always want to have their stories told. They want their acts to be chronicled, their names to be recorded, and someone to witness what they're living through. I also found that proximity to death makes people honest, both with themselves and with others. In contrast to politicians and uh, sometimes senior brass or public affairs officers, the grunts who are actually doing the killing and dying tend to be remarkably forthright and unashamed of the truth, however inconvenient it might be. They have little patience for propaganda. This company from the 82nd had already lost several paratroopers when Joel and I joined them and every patrol we accompanied them on was ambushed shortly after it left the wire. Sorry. Uh, everyone I spoke with in the unit, everyone I spent time with, interviewed from PFCs to COs to the CO, was clear-eyed and candid uh, about the fact that as soon as they handed over this outpost to the Afghan security forces, the district was going to fall to the Taliban. And that's exactly what happened. And that was in 2012, I believe. Uh, by chance, while Joel and I were on this embed with the 82nd in Ghazni, 
Then President Obama visited Afghanistan and gave a televised speech from Bagram Airfield in which he asserted that uh, the surge, which was wrapping up at the time, had been a resounding success and declaring that, quote, the tide has turned. We broke the Taliban's momentum. Uh, in 2013, I left Afghanistan to cover the Battle of Aleppo in Syria, which was an early centerpiece of a very complicated and fragmenting war uh, that eventually gave rise to ISIS and the U.S.-led campaign against it. ISIS, you guys have studied and know about him, I assume. Um, that campaign, it included the Battle of Sinjar in northern Iraq in 2015, here, and the Battle of Mosul, which was also in Iraq in 2016. This picture, also done by a professional, um, my colleague Victor Blue, while we were embedded for about two months with an elite unit from the Iraqi army. And then finally, there was the climactic battle to recapture Raqqa, the capital of ISIS's self-declared caliphate, again in Syria in 2017. If all these images I just showed kind of look similar, similar, that's because they represent a chapter in the global war on terrorism that spanned countries and years, but featured uh, certain consistent attributes that were distinct from the counterinsurgency campaign in Afghanistan. First of all, most of the fighting took place in urban environments, as you can see. And secondly, the devastating use of U.S. artillery and air power radically intensified. Third, the U.S. footprint was vastly reduced in favor of a much heavier reliance on local forces. So this picture from Raqqa was taken by my colleague Mauricio Lima. And uh, the soldier that you can see here at the bottom of the frame running across the street for, for cover from incoming ISIS uh, mortar fire uh, was a member of the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF, which was a coalition of Arab and uh, Kurdish soldiers that were basically the ground troops in the uh, fight against ISIS in Syria. During that fight, the SDF lost more than 10,000 troops, and the U.S. lost two. So that kind of gives you an idea of how uh, we were pivoting to a different uh, way of conducting these wars from what we had been doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was the same case uh, in Mosul, where this picture comes from, again, from Victor where two Americans were also killed in this battle and thousands of Iraqi soldiers. Uh, the man in the body bag here was Jawad Mustafa. He was a young sergeant in the unit that Victor and I were following. Jawad was one of 12 members of the company size element who were killed in Mosul over the course of a few months. This was a particularly bad day when uh, dozens of the guys were killed or wounded uh, and a lot of them suffered amputations um, from an onslaught of up-armored suicide vehicles, these kind of terrifying Mad Max creations that ISIS would push out in waves uh, against units like this one who only had um, uh, light arms, rifles, PKMs uh, that were powerless to stop them. He, he was injured the same day. Uh, like the Iraqis, the SDF units I spent time with in Raqqa, the Syrian Democratic Forces, had no armored vehicles, heavy weapons, or even body armor. What they did have, though, were iPads with satellite maps that allowed them to send the grid coordinates uh, of targets for air and artillery requests to their U.S. American uh, counterparts. 
and uh, the, qu the requests were almost always approved from what I saw in any case. Uh, the U.S. De de deployed thousands of m munitions on Raqqa. Um, Laser-guided Hellfire missiles, one-ton unguided bombs, and that uh, aerial assault was complemented by a massive use of triple uh, seven howitzers by the U.S. Marines. More than 30,000 shells were deployed on Raqqa during that battle. And the result was that we completely ob obliterated the city. Um, and because ISIS had prevented civilians from leaving, there was still a sizable civilian population living there uh, during that time. <clears throat> I recorded these videos of Raqqa on a later trip when I returned after the battle to see the damage. Every street and neighborhood looked like this. Uh, each of the destroyed buildings that you see here had families living in them that either had lived in them throughout the American bombardment or had left and come back because they had nowhere else to go and nowhere, nowhere else to live. The destruction like this was just so pervasive that it almost has a numbing effect when you look at it um, over a long period of time. And it's, it's, hard, it's hard to process how comprehensive it is. I don't know if you can see, but every single sidewalk, wall, structure, car, uh, hen house was either hit by shrapnel or, or shock waves. Um, An estimated 1,600 civilians were killed during the battle, and a lot of them by uh, the bombardment. Uh, everywhere I went in the city, I met people who had uh, lost limbs, amputees, to um, U.S. air and artillery strikes, and there were a lot of um, a lot of them were homeless and living amid the ruin the ruins. This is Fatma. She was 10 years old, and she lost her right leg when an errant uh, coalition strike hit her house, killing her mother and her three sisters. At the time that I took this photo, then-President Trump had ordered a rapid withdrawal of all U.S. personnel from northern Syria. So there was no medical support for the civilian survivors of the battle, like Fatma, no humanitarian aid, no reconstruction projects, nothing. This is uh, the only hospital in the city, the only, the sole municipal um, healthcare facility, and it had also been destroyed by U.S. airstrikes along with all of its CAT scanners, x-ray machines, and other uh, essential medical equipment. <clears throat> And to be clear, ISIS had occupied this building and was using it um, as, a, as a machine gun position and headquarters. So that's why we were uh, targeting it. But uh, because of the withdrawal that followed, um, this is what we left behind. There was no um, effort whatsoever to um, to replace the healthcare infrastructure of the city that we had uh, obliterated. And when the US military leaves a, an area, like in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, all of the Western NGOs, um, aid workers, development firms um, that are capable of doing this kind of humanitarian work also leave because the, of the uh, security risk. So the, I was in Raqqa for about a month on this trip, and I didn't see a, another Westerner or American that whole time. I did see Russians, though, um, who they were happily, eagerly filling the vacuum that we left behind there. This is a U.S. base, actually, a U.S. Special Forces base. 
uh, that had been hastily abandoned after President Trump's order to withdraw, and which Russian troops had occupied the next day, uh, raising the Russian flag, which you can see here, where an American one had flown previously. Uh, given the scale of the destruction in Raqqa, I was struck by how little attention it garnered at home. Even during the battle, there, only, there were only a handful of other journalists, and most of them were European and freelancers like me. Uh, one, reason that, one reason for this, for the uh, paucity of journalists on the ground during the battle, was that frontline access had, been, had become extremely difficult and limited. And uh, the main reason for that was that Special Operations Forces, or SOF, um, now comprised most of the limited U.S. presence on the ground. It's no secret that the SOF community is leery of the press and transparency in general. And as that community assumed an increasingly prominent role in Syria and elsewhere, it exported that ethos to our local partners like the SDF. When I went back to Afghanistan in 2019, SOF and CIA ground force operators had completely taken over the war from conventional troops. And it was impossible for us journalists to embed with any American units or even with the Afghan National Security Forces. This is a photo I took uh, in the Maman Valley of the Achin district of Nangahar province, where a massive ordnance air blast or mother of all bombs had been deployed about a year earlier. Afghanistan at that time was the deadliest conflict in the world, but it was being fought in complete obscurity. It was invisible to the American people. As in Iraq and Syria, one reason for that in invisibility, something that enabled that invisibility, was the fact that the war barely affected uh, Americans. Between 2014 and 2020, fewer than 100 U.S. service members were killed in Afghanistan, but during that same period, more than 45,000 Afghan soldiers and police were killed, a fatality rate comparable to America's at the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, one of those casualties, fatalities, was Colonel Daoud, who was the commander of the Afghan battalion that Joel and I had embedded with in 2012. That's him on the, on the left. Uh, the casualty numbers in Afghanistan would be dwarfed in Ukraine. As soon as Russia launched its full-scale invasion on February 24th, 2022, it was evident that we were entering a cycle of modern warfare that would be novel in important ways. For me, since I live in France, the first and most obvious novelty was that I could take a bus to the war. Uh, this is a, a picture that I took through the window of the bus uh, that I boarded on February 26, two days after the invasion, in Paris, actually, uh, with my friend Anastasia who is a French-Ukrainian, uh, and the bus was bringing Ukrainian immigrants who lived in France back to Ukraine uh, to, help defend their, to help defend their country, like Anastasia was doing. Uh, it dropped us off. Well, first of all, I'll tell you, here, this picture I took at the border um, after 30 hours on the road, uh, the border of Ukraine and Poland. And when we got there, there were th these throngs of women and children um, crossing back uh, out of Ukraine into Poland while we were, we were going the other way. Um, and the bus dropped us off in Lviv, which is uh, not too far from the border there. Um, and this was the scene at the train station in Lviv. It was also just inundated with displaced peoples, people trying to get away from Kyiv. Uh, at that time, a 40-mile-long Russian armored column was bearing down on Kyiv from Belarus, and it was universally assumed that the Ukrainians didn't stand a chance, and that the Russians would promptly encircle the capital and annihilate it. 
when Anastasia and I got on a train at this station going towards Kyiv, we were the only people on it. We arrived the next morning, we were on the train all night and arrived the next morning and were able to get a taxi from the train station to Anastasia's uh, father's house in Kyiv. The city was completely deserted and silent except for sporadic air raid sirens. So defying all the Western analysts and experts, the Ukrainians were able to bog down the, that Russian, that 40 mile long Russian column in the suburbs north of Kyiv. <clears throat> um, I took this picture at the main bridge over the Irpine River on the outskirts of the city, the northern outskirts. The Ukrainians had destroyed the bridge to impede the advance of, of the Russian column. And the smoke that you can see here, I don't know if it really shows up on the screen, but uh, if you can see smoke in the background, that's from the fighting in those suburbs, including some that would later become notorious like Bucha. A makeshift uh, footbridge had been cobbled together for civilians fleeing the combat in Bucha and elsewhere. I was there with a team of Ukrainian volunteers from a medical battalion that Anastasia belonged to. Those are the guys you can see in uniform here, helping folks over the bridge. And once again, it was mostly women and children. A lot of the men stayed behind to um, protect their houses, and uh, we would find out later that many of them were killed. You can see uh, that this bridge and this civilian crossing was also shelled by the Russians while these civilians were trying to cross it, and a lot of them were killed um, trying to escape those northern neighborhoods. Uh, the Russians also bombarded the city proper during this time with rockets, artillery, missiles, um, and they mostly hit residential apartment buildings. It seemed uh, obvious to me at the time that the strategic intent of these strikes was to terrorize and demoralize the population, to weaken its will to resist. Um, it was interesting to me because the previous conflicts I'd covered had all been very asymmetrical, and with the exception of Aleppo, I had always been on the side of superior force, covering and reporting from the side of superior uh, force. So now in Kyiv, um, I, for really for the first time, was on the receiving end of modern industrial scale ordinance, um, and could feel the unique fear that it instills, um, and I think it, it's fair to say that it's probably a fear uh, that's comparable to what Iraqis in, felt in Mosul and what Syrians felt in, in Raqqa in 2016 and 17. This is actually a later video, I should say, um, that I took in Kyiv in October when Russia deployed its first uh, Iranian kamikaze drone. I don't know if y'all saw that on the news, um, but the drone impacted a couple, of, uh, a couple of blocks away from the hotel where I was staying. And as it passed overhead, unfortunately I didn't catch it on video, but as it passed overhead, its weird slowness, the slowness of its trajectory combined with this kind of loud, crude mechanical noise that it made, gave the impression of a flying lawnmower, which was the nickname that uh, Ukrainians gave it after this day. This is downtown Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine, which I visited in mid-March. And again, it had just been devastated by Russian shelling. Um, the day after I arrived in Kharkiv, the Russians shelled Barabashova, which is the biggest open-air market in all of Europe, or was biggest market in all of Europe. 
my driver and I here tried to get close, but it turned into a, a massive fire and we weren't able to, to reach the actual site of impact. Uh, the next morning, the very next morning, the Russians shelled and destroyed another market across town uh, w where civilians were going for food and, and provisions after this one was destroyed. That's here. And while I was at this site, um, a, a double tap strike from the Russians targeting the first responders uh, severely wounded uh, a woman standing near me. The next day, uh, the following morning, they leveled this uh, public university, also pretty close to where we were staying. Uh, after every strike, local firefighters, Ukrainian firefighters, would try to extract survivors from the rubble. Uh, here, they're trying to rescue a man who miraculously survived this attack and was buried alive in, in the basement while he was using the toilet down there. And they actually reached him after eight hours of uh, breaking up the concrete like this. And when they pulled him out, he was in remarkably high spirits and pretty much unharmed. Uh, in general, people were not terrorized or demoralized by these bombings, and their will to resist was not weakened. On the contrary, the attacks galvanized them, both individually and as a society, forging solidarity and patriotic zeal against a common antagonist. For me, it was hard not to think of Afghanistan and the way in which the Taliban had grown in size and influence the more we bombed them. In late March, the tide started to turn and Russian forces began withdrawing from the northern towns that they had occupied for the past month, leaving behind a trail of wreckage. I have like dozens of photos uh, like this one. I just uh, destroyed Russian tanks and oftentimes the turrets of these tanks would pop off and you'd find them you know, like 100 yards away from the main body and the tracks of the tank. I just picked this picture because I was proud of the composition. So this is a city called Trostianets um, that I visited a couple of days after the Russians left. And all this damage that you see here downtown was caused by Ukrainian artillery because they had encircled uh, the town while it was occupied by Russian forces and just hammered uh, all of their technicals and armor um, that was for some idiotic reason consolidated in this open uh, downtown train depot and park. Uh, it was a pretty wild scene because I don't know if you can see here, but in the upper left corner of the frame, there's a monument to a uh, Soviet World War II tank uh, unit. And that's a life-size Soviet tank from World War II that was the only thing that survived in this whole, uh, this whole scene of devastation. It's just surrounded by uh, destroyed actual tank parts. Here's a better, better picture of it. Uh, while I was in Trostianets, residents were starting to come out of their basements for the first time in weeks and they were charging their phones and connecting to the local, to the Starlink at the local city hall to try to get news of loved ones and news of the war from other parts of Ukraine. Up to this point, very little information had come out, leaked out from behind the Russian lines. So we didn't really know what life had been like for the people um, in Russian occupied areas of Ukraine. Before, uh, before the withdrawal, Russian withdrawal. Now, we reporters could start to go to some of these areas and talk to people and begin to piece together um, how they had been treated by the uh, occupational forces. By the time I got back to Kyiv, the Russians had retreated from those northern 
neighborhoods, suburbs that I was talking about earlier. Um, and as the first journalists started to go into those areas, we found a lot of evidence of atrocities, Russian atrocities. For several days, I walked around Bucha, that's where I took this picture, um, photographing uh, executed, the bodies of executed civilians and talking to survivors about um, what they had been through. This man um, had been shot in the head and left on the side of the road. I have a couple of tough pictures uh, coming up, just FYI. This man had been shot in the head in his backyard. This man had also been shot in the head in his backyard. Um, most of the photos I have are a lot more gruesome and graphic than this. Uh, people's skulls have been blown open from point blank range and some bodies had been mutilated and burnt, uh, chopped up, lit on fire, even decapitated. Uh, Ukrainians love pets. Uh, they love cats, love dogs. And a lot of people stayed in Bucha because they didn't want to abandon their pets, actually. Uh, for us journalists, sometimes to locate the victims of killings in, in, in these neighborhoods, we would follow the sound of barking, um, which is what we did here. Um, this dog was extremely protective of its, of its former owner and wouldn't let me enter the house. And eventually we uh, opened a can of tuna fish and set it in the yard and it, uh, it ran out because it hadn't eaten in probably a week or two. And when I went inside, uh, I found another victim in the kitchen, uh, another elderly woman. The neighbors told me that they were two sisters who'd been living together for years. And as with many of the dead in Bucha, it was unclear why they'd been killed. So a couple of weeks later, Vladimir Putin uh, awarded an honorary title to the Russian unit that had been responsible for the massacres in Bucha in recognition of their, quote, uh, heroism and valor. And that kind of signaled the direction that the war was taking. After giving up on Kyiv, the Russian forces pivoted uh, to the east, to the Donbass region uh, in, in far eastern Ukraine. And uh, it soon became apparent that this phase of the war would be even more brutal uh, and merciless than the first one. In June, I went with a translator to the town of Bakhmut. You've probably heard about the Battle of Bakhmut. Um, this was early on before it became a real focus of uh, the front in the east. Uh, but it was already being he heavily shelled and most of the residents had already evacuated. Uh, there was one hotel that was still open and my translator and I stayed there. We were the only guests except for a few soldiers. Uh, one night, about a week after uh, into our stay there, we were jolted awake by the most bowel loosening series of explosions I'd ever experienced up to that point. And I was sure that the hotel was gonna collapse, the building was gonna come down. But it turned out that uh, the house across the street, this house here, uh, had been hit and, and not uh, the one where we were staying. I took this picture at dawn when we came out of the basement. This is an apartment complex that was a few blocks away uh, that was also hit that, uh, that same night. There were no military targets near any of the missile or rocket uh, strikes that I witnessed in Bakhmut or in any of the other cities or towns in, in the Donbass that I visited. Uh, the front lines where the actual combat was happening between Ukrainian forces and Russian forces were on the outskirts of the population centers but it was hard to tell what exactly was going, going on there, what was happening, uh, because just like in Afghanistan in 2019 and in Syria towards the end of the campaign against ISIS, uh, it was impossible to embed with Ukrainian forces. Um, the government had basically prohibited frontline access to, to journalists. Uh, 
um, the best you could hope for were kind of curated dog and pony shows that a, a public affairs officer would take you on to a, a rearward artillery or mortars team for a couple of hours. And that's why you might have noticed for a long period all the photos you saw in a lot of the major American newspapers um, from Ukraine <laughs> were shots of mortar teams or artillery teams and the image of a of flame bursting out of the cannon of a howitzer. Um, they're nice images, but they don't tell you anything about uh, what life is like for the grunts in the trenches, um, who those grunts are, or how they feel about the war that they've been charged uh, with fighting. And that's the story I wanted to tell, and some of my colleagues as well, and it was difficult to do so. Finally, in March, uh, I was able to get access to an army unit on the southern out outskirts of Bakhmut. This was thanks to my friend, uh, Maxim Dundiuk. He's an incredible Ukrainian photographer, and he knew a battalion commander in the 28th uh, Separate Mechanized Brigade that basically told us we could stay in the trenches for as long as, as we could take it <laughs> uh, with his guys. So Max took this photo of a 22-year-old sniper, codenamed Student, uh, and he's shooting a Barrett, an American Barrett 50 cal, at a Russian position a few hundred yards away. Uh, student kept a pair of candy wrappers in his pocket that he would stuff in his ears uh, before each time he shot this weapon because it's, it's really deafening. And for me, it was kind of, uh, it was wild watching him do this because in 2012, I had watched a U.S. Marine stuff, uh, break a cigarette in half, sorry, and stuff the two pieces in his ears before shooting the exact same weapon at a Taliban position. Um, that Marine was later killed. He was killed a few weeks after I met him. And I don't know what has happened to student, but it's hard to be optimistic, um, honestly. Max and I ended up staying with 1st Battalion of the 28th Brigade for two weeks, and we found that Ukrainian forces were suffering enormous casualties. This had obliged the government to conscript a lot of uh, civilian men, farmers, carpenters, with no combat experience or soldiering experience to replace uh, those casualties. This battalion that we were with uh, had 80% draftees who had been um, who had been conscripted, mobilized, and given uh, Kalashnikovs with very minimal training uh, to replace uh, the, the soldiers that they had lost. Only two of the men in this photo uh, had been with the unit since the beginning of the war. The second from the left with the dark beard, he was codenamed Bison, and he'd already been hospitalized three times for multiple shrapnel and bullet wounds. And then the guy, the young man on the far right, he was codenamed Odessa. And uh, he had gone AWOL after the Battle of Kherson in the south, um, after basically all of his friends were killed. They had taken enormous, enormous fatalities during, during that campaign. And he just needed a break, basically. All, everyone he knew in, in the unit had been either injured or killed. He went home for about a month just to rest and recuperate, and then he uh, came back and voluntarily rejoined the unit when they came to the Donbass. He told me that uh, he felt guilty, and he said uh, his exact words were, I realized that my place was here. And uh, Odessa was killed by artillery shortly after my article was published. Artillery was by far the most for formidable threat um, in the Donbass. You can see what Russian uh, shelling did to these trees at uh, Bison and Odessa's position. And you can see here, this tree here, that's, uh, that's from shrapnel. That's a piece of shrapnel. And every tree, no matter how skinny, along this, in this whole area, had been gouged like that. Even little twigs. 
I don't know if that really shows up, but you can kind of see the whole line where the, they call it the splash, when a mortar hits and the shrapnel goes up and out. And this is a really good lesson, by the way, if you ever find yourself in this situation of getting low, getting down, because the idea when you hit the deck is that you're below this line of, where, that you can see in these trees, this white line where the shrapnel has come across. Uh, most of the Dumbass is open farmland divided up by parallel and perpendicular tree lines. They kind of form a grid. And the tree lines offer cover and concealment that uh, allows infantry to maneuver or uh, establish defensive positions. Every once in a while, an assault element will go across the open field and try to uh, capture an enemy held tree line. But the battalion we were with and the whole brigade actually was so under strength that um, all they could do was maintain. Like they weren't moving forward, they were just basically holding their positions and weathering this relentless daily barrage of ordnance from the Russian, Russian side. Sorry. Uh, Max took this picture of me standing outside of Bison and Odessa's uh, dugout. This, uh, this position, this dugout, had been dialed in by the Russians. They had already hit it directly on the roof uh, with a 120 mortar and uh, set it on fire. And basically to refortify the structure, the Ukrainians had just stacked more logs on top of the burnt ones and maintained it. This is the inside Bison in Odessa's bunker. Uh, as you can see, it wasn't really tall enough for me to stand up in, but it had nevertheless been divided up into two bunks, two levels of bunks, and there were eight guys sleeping in here at a time. This is Siava. He was uh, another draftee. Like all the draftees I met, he was uh, poor, uh, didn't have a university degree, and worked in the trades. Your best chance of survival on the front in Ukraine is, um, is to spend as much time as possible underground. So the first piece of advice that veterans give to new arrivals when they show up on the front is, if you want to live, dig. This position happened to lie on a chalk vein, so the soldier here had to hack out his dugout with, uh, with hatchets, because it was mostly stone. This is the dugout where Max and I slept. Um, while most of the combat on the front in Ukraine consists of artillery exchanges, there is uh, direct engagement and combat between uh, Russian and Ukrainian forces with small arms. And all of that occurs on what's called the zero line, which is the absolute forwardmost point of, um, of the front. So this is a periscope that uh, soldiers at an OP on the zero line were using to observe uh, the Russians across the no man's land uh, without exposing their heads to above the berm to, to snipers. And I took this photo just by holding my iPhone above the berm. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, it shows the, the heavily mined no man's land, which is this open field. It used to be sunflower, uh, sunflowers. And then across the field, you can see that darker tree line. That's uh, the Russians. That was held by, that whole tree line was held by the Russians. So it's about 200 yards away. Um, every day, the guys at this uh, zero line position were engaging in firefights uh, with, with the Russians. And a few minutes after I took this picture, an RPG came screaming across the field uh, and detonated behind us. Then, it was, then there were volleys of machine gun fire and um, basically a gunfight that lasted for around 30 minutes. A Russian drone also buzzed overhead and dropped a grenade on us. It uh, landed about 10 feet wide of the of the trench where we were taking cover. 
Uh, drones, I'm sure you've seen and read about the preponderance of drones in Ukraine on the front, and it's really one of the, one of the defining characteristics of that war. This is a, a drone gun. Uh, I don't know if you've learned about these, but they essentially um, scramble the navigation system in the drone and paralyze it, and then while he's while the, while the drone is frozen, this other Ukrainian is trying to shoot it down with his Kalashnikov. It didn't work in this case. Uh, these kind of futuristic tools, it's like something out of Starship Troopers, right? Uh, they make for a really jarring contrast with uh, what's really a, the more general anachronistic feeling of the front. It feels uh, usually more like World War I than World War III. This is a Maxim gun. It's uh, the first fully automatic weapon ever made. This particular model was fabricated in 1945, but it's the exact same design as the original, which was invented in 1884. And 1st Battalion was using this on a daily basis uh, on the Zero Line. Uh, despite all the significant um, and uh, expensive U.S. contributions to the Ukrainian arsenal, infantry units like the 28th were woefully under-equipped. Uh, while I was there, shells were being rationed to the point where the Russians were firing about 10 times the rate as the Ukrainians. And in lieu of sufficient ammo, the Ukrainians did what they do best, which, was, uh, which is improvise. So this is Odessa again, the young soldier who was later killed. And here he's, he's using his knife to carve out the rust from the threads uh, so that he can screw on uh, the threads of a mortar, an 82 millimeter mortar, so he can screw on the fuse and then attach that mortar to an RPG launcher, which my understanding is you're not supposed to do. There he goes. Uh, it didn't really work, and you can see just how old and rusted the, the warhead is. Uh, it landed short of the, way short of the Russian line. <laughs> this drafty uh, figured out how to remove the timer inside of these rockets so that uh, they wouldn't self-detonate after a certain distance, and they could then be used as substitutes for longer range artillery, which they didn't have. Uh, the soldier on the right uh, yeah, this was kind of a nerve-wracking thing when he's banging the rocket <laughs> against the handlebox. The soldier on the right, uh, who's opening the component there, timer component, was codenamed Volonyaka, and he commanded a Soviet-era armored vehicle called a BRM, but that was known by the Ukrainians as the Iron Casket. Oh, I think I got a freeze here. One sec. It's locked up. Oh, yeah, it's not working. Oh, that's it. Okay, iron casket. Um, at least twice a day, Volan Yaka and his crew would go out to the zero line and shoot those modified rockets across a no man's land, and they would change position each time. Uh, the reason it's called an iron casket is because it's, it's not really a tank, it's very lightly armored, and any uh, nearby impact can start a fire uh, inside really quickly, and it's hard, to, it's hard to escape, it's hard to get out of. I couldn't even get down through the hatch with my flak jacket on. Uh, the, the battalion also relied on an old SBG-9 recoilless rifle, which you can see here. Um, it used the same warheads, the same rockets, uh, without the timers. Um, at the beginning of the war, the 1st Battalion had a bunch of these, uh, more than a dozen, I believe, but they'd all been destroyed by Russian shelling, uh, mainly in Kherson in the south, and they were down to this last uh, anti-tank gun. It was the only anti-tank gun they had. And as you can see, it was in pretty decrepit condition. Uh, the trigger component was broken, so the sergeant here 
had to connect each charge using uh, household electrical wire and uh, masking tape. He was uh, the sergeant, the guy talking on his radio, uh, was a 42-year-old father of three, codenamed Caban, and he too had been uh, wounded already numerous times. The younger soldier uh, on the gun right now, um, he was codenamed Cadet, and he just turned 19, the same age as Caban's son. Caban had sent his son to Germany um, because he didn't want him to be killed in Ukraine. And he told me uh, on numerous occasions in front of Cadet, without any bravado um, or humor, that he was sure that they were both, he, both he and Cadet were going to be killed before the end of the war. And that sort of attitude was pretty common on the front, in the trenches. There's something special about artillery uh, warfare that instills in you a kind of grim fatalism. Uh, either the round is going to land on you or it isn't. And there's really not much you can do about it. There's not much you can do to alter your, your chances. The essential variable on the front is time. The longer you stay out there, the higher the chances are that you'll get hit. And if you stay out there long enough, getting hit starts to feel inevitable. Oh, sorry. Go to the last slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, also, I over time here, so. Um, should I just show the videos? Yeah, show that last video. Okay. Um, Professor Martin thought it might be interesting if uh, I showed you just a couple quick videos with the sound on to show what it feels like to get. Um, to take incoming, basically. Uh, these guys were in the International Legion, but uh, maybe if you have questions after, I can take those. Okay, so here I'm following, uh, this is an American, actually, codenamed Herring, and uh, we're walking through a neighborhood in Volodar in eastern Ukraine. When, uh, yeah rocket comes in. And then I'll just show you one more. This... The best, a lot of, the problem is a lot of these buildings don't have basements, so you just kind of stand in the stairwell and, uh, and hope for the best, but this is also in Bolidar. Uh Oh yeah, it's already 820. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Sorry for going long. <laughs>